For those that are joining, we'll be beginning the event momentarily, just letting everyone else join. For those joining, we'll give it about another 30 seconds, then we'll begin. And then uh, as the other folks join, they'll, they'll see us live. Okay, I think we're going to begin and uh, we'll let others join as they as they enter. But let's start with the, uh, with the folks that we have in the room here. Good morning. Happy Tuesday. Uh, my name is Matt Cohen, Vice President of Government Affairs for the Long Island Association. Very happy to be here today uh, for a very special LIA special executive event that we're doing in partnership with our Financial Services and Tax Policy Committee. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Maureen Evers Willox. She is a managing partner at KPMG in the Long Island office. She's uh, one of the chairs of our financial services and tax policy committee and an LIA board member. Uh, she does a great job. She did a great job pulling this event together. Uh, and with that, uh, I want to just introduce Maureen. Thanks, Maureen. Hey, thanks, Matt. I really am excited to, uh, to be here with you all today and to present this topic that has been so in the news of late. Um, particularly the last, say, six to eight months, the SPAC market has gone wild. So really excited to have this topic and two really great panel members. One which probably doesn't need an introduction, Jim McCann, who is the founder and chair of 1-800-Flowers, uh, one of our great companies on Long Island. And he recently launched a SPAC, which made it particularly interesting for him to be part of our panel today. And then I have one of my partners, Dean Bell, who leads our transaction services practice who's been living and breathing this back uh, discussion and topic for quite some time now. So uh, I'm really excited to have them both here with us today. So I'm gonna uh, just introduce them. They're gonna bring this to life. I get the easy job just to moderate the conversation, but they're really gonna bring it to life because they've been really knee deep in it for quite some time. So maybe Dean, I'll start with you. And Dean, what's credentialed you to actually be able to speak to this in such an authoritative way? Let us, you know, let us in on it. Authoritative way, I'm not sure about that, Marie. I can tell you that um, I'm transaction services leader, as you mentioned, for KPMG. And in my role, I've been working uh, with our overall task force, both navigating our audit clients, not audit clients at KPMG. And the reality is we saw over the last 18, 24 months, a real movement from the traditional IPO towards the SPAC IPO. So as a result of that, in my role, I was the one trying to coordinate all the activities for the firm. And so, as you said, the last six months has been very, very busy. As a result of that, I can say that I've seen a lot of these SPAC conversations and seen a lot of uh, what's been happening. So I hope that that gives me enough to say I'm credible enough to discuss what's happening in the marketplace. Absolutely. And, and Jim, um, you know, you have quite a, a story. I mean, you've started from 1-800-Flowers, went public, and now you have your own SPAC. Give us a little bit about your story and, and uh, you know, I think everybody would love to hear that. I'm not speaking to you because I found out you're a Yankee fan. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 uh, I sometimes play a Mets fan because living on Long Island, it's tough being a Bronx girl, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sure, I'll give you a, a thumbnail here, Maureen. Uh, and it's nice to be with you and uh, Dean this morning. Uh, to talk about what's going on in our markets, because as you say, Maureen, it's very much uh, centered at a plate in terms of business news, at least. And our story is a simple one. I, I started uh, Flowers a, a long time ago. And uh, coming up on five years ago, almost five years ago, I stepped down as uh, the CEO of the company. And my youngest brother, Chris, became the CEO and I became the chair. And one of the intentions we had with that was for me to uh, set up a, a private office and investment platform, which we call Clarum, and to use that platform to do investing beyond flowers, uh, involving the uh, next generation of the family in those investment decisions. And uh, so I was looking for someone who would run that capability for us, and I was introduced to 
Paul Stamoulis has since become my friend and my partner, and he runs Clarum, our family office investment platform. And along the way, uh, we've been doing a few different things. We had, uh, Chris and I had always been investing in uh, private equity and venture capital funds, particularly those that had a technology bent to them, uh, because it was our day job's interest to know where our technology was going, what new tools were going to be emerging, and what should we be involving ourselves in as a company. And Flowers has had a reputation as being early to new technologies, going all the way back 30 plus 35 years to when 800 numbers were the new rage when we changed our name to, uh, to uh, 1 800 Flowers. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, I'd say that we as a company have been through five waves. First, it was retail stores, and we had a lot of them. Uh, then we changed our name to 1-800-Flowers, and that became our primary access modality. Always driven by what's the new technology, how is it going to change things, how do we make our services more convenient for people to access. Our premise has always been if we're convenient, then we're really in a good position to help our customers uh, to act on their thoughtfulness. And so the 800 number was natural. And then Chris joined the company uh, and we had uh, an, an interest in all the new technologies of the early 90s. And the one that we kept coming back to uh, while the other 49 trials didn't work out, the online world, what we later called the internet, really started to take hold. By 1995, uh, the browser was introduced by Netscape, changed the world, organized the internet. By 98, it was it's clearly overwhelming all our other channels. So three waves, stores, 800 number, and, uh, and the internet. And then uh, about uh, 13 years ago, uh, the, uh, the move then with the next wave for us was everything about social and everything about mobile. And now the fifth wave is the most exciting of all. And my brother, Chris, I think, was the one who coined the term uh, uh, conversational commerce about six or seven years ago, but it's morphed to be more about engagement commerce. So first you have a relationship with an individual and then you have the potential to, to, uh, uh, to do commerce with them. And along the way, we've always been interested in the technology. So therefore investing in them, but not to the degree that we'd like to. So we set up the family office, Byron Paul came in and he uh, has us now in about 15 or 16 different funds that we invest in. We purchased a few companies uh, particularly in the media space, uh, particularly with the premise to turn them into live events companies. Uh, it was all Paul's decision. I, I didn't think it was a good idea in the face of pandemic to go after live event companies. <laughs> but lo and behold, that company, which we now call Clara Media, which has in it things like CDX, an innovation uh, company. It has uh, Techconomy, which is a, a magazine, newsletters, and online and events around how technology is changing the world. And then finally, Worth Magazine, now called Worth Media. And all of those, he, uh, Paul uh, uh, crafted into a company called Clara Media. And it's frankly, the post pandemic doing quite well. And we have a terrific leader there in Josh Campbell. But so our idea was always to do private investing, acquisitions, and fund investing. And then last year, uh, Paul and I were asked to, we're very active LPs. So if we're in a fund, we're active with, with the management of that fund and the, and the companies in the portfolio. And we were asked to advise a couple of companies on capital structure, their, their business plan, and we did. And it turned out that we thought that the best solution for their needs was a SPAC. We didn't have one, so we referred them to people who we knew were good people, a smart, capable, who were in the SPAC world, and we said to ourselves, well, we've done this a few times now. Maybe, maybe we're not the brightest uh, people in the world, but it seems like perhaps we should have a SPAC as well. And last fall, we decided to go down that path and, and Paul's been leading those efforts. So that's, that's how we get here. Wow, that's a really re interesting story and pretty exciting. You've done, covered a lot of ground. <laughs> what so a go. <laughs> well, we have a great agenda for everyone, um, but before we get into the agenda, I just want to acknowledge and thank my uh, fellow committee members on the LIA's Financial Services and Tax Policy Committee, which includes Carolyn Mazenga, who's with us today, Miriam Tannenbaum, um, and Jeff Alter. So collectively, we're thrilled to bring you all this, this great topic. And what we're going to cover today is, first, we're going to just talk about 
what is what is an IPO? What is a SPAC? And how do you get prepared to become a public company? We'll talk about the um, SPAC transaction lifestyle. And then we'll talk about the financial reporting considerations that um, need to be contemplated as you consider going into one of these vehicles. So really, really great stuff. And I, I, we'll kick it off with Dean. I'm gonna ask you a question. Maybe, can you give us an overview on SPACs, including what is a SPAC? Um, what are the market conditions? And I know that there's been some recent developments you may wanna to touch on. And then what's the transaction lifestyle? Um, sorry, not the lifestyle, but the life, <laughs> life cycle of, of a SPAC. If you could just cover those topics, I think that'd be great. We're gonna talk about life, uh, lifestyle. <laughs> I know Dean comes from Greenwich, Connecticut, and I don't understand why he doesn't have one of those little sweaters over his shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little too warm for that here in the city today, Jim. But you know, I'll say this, Maureen, that the, I gotta tee it up because the real the real excitement here is gonna be Jim and his story. But I'll spend some time, as you said, teeing up what a SPAC is all about and why this all matters. So let me just tell you what SPAC means. It's a special purpose acquisition company. And so just to kind of tee up what happens here. You generally have a sponsor who is a sponsor of a SPAC. Then you have public shareholders. The idea is that you have this blank shell company where essentially it becomes a public entity with this, the equity and the cash essentially. Then what happens is that those two individuals, the public shareholders and the sponsors go out and look for a operating company that is private. And what happens is you come together and that private company becomes a public company. So that's a SPAC in a nutshell. It's been known as a blank check company only because you have this structure that's out there trying to acquire various entities. And once you connect with the private company, that's really known as a despacking process. So one thing I will get into in the next couple of slides, discussion here on warrants, um, Maureen, but I gotta be careful here because it's definitely one of those areas that's been a little controversial in the past. But one thing I will say that's unique for a SPAC is that the cash that you have in trust is used for the most part for the transaction. So in terms of being able to have cash for advisors and helping you think through the overall structure, that cash is somewhat limited. So a SPAC's gonna be really, really focused on what it wants to spend its uh, available funds on because it is made essentially to go out and acquire other companies. So your question is going to the overall life cycle to explain a little bit what, what's going on here. So as I mentioned, the way things start is that you as a SPAC go out and complete an IPO. So you essentially have this cash, you have this equity, you're a public company, you go out looking for companies. Now, generally speaking, uh, the overall investor profile is going to say that we're going to look for companies of a certain type. And therefore, shareholders say, yep, I'm interested in that. Someone like Jim is really, really great. And I want to make sure that I align to him because he's got great ideas, a proven track record. And therefore, they feel pretty good about uh, providing their funds for to that type of spec. So you go out, look for your different targets, and you find a target, which is great. And at that point in time, you enter into a overall letter of intent, and you say, yes, I'm going to go out and buy this company. Now, as you get to this process, you got to think about this. The shareholders need to figure out if they want to go along with this overall transaction, because back to the idea, they put their money in based on, generally speaking, the overall reputation of the SPAC founder and sponsors. But given what's going on, they may say, yep, I'm interested in this. They may say, no, I'm not. There's got to be an overall shareholder approval. And if they don't want to go with it, they can go ahead and say, nope, I'm not interested. Give me back my cash. I'm out of here. Or they can say, yep, let's go ahead and make this thing happen. Then you have a business combination. Now, one thing about the SPACs of late, you made a point uh, starting this, Maureen, that said, what makes it so popular? Well, the biggest thing right now is that we're seeing a bunch of different folks get involved. I knew that we hit prime time, and Jim probably knows the lyrics to this song when I saw a rapper go out there and do the SPAC rap, which tells me we've now hit uh, prime time that we have athletes and celebrities now trying to find their SPACs, but of course, don't have the reputation that Jim does. But let's get into more about this. I'll go to the next slide to kind of explain more about what's happening here. So... Okay, you tell me, Dean, I want to go ahead and go down this SPAC process. Well, why? I mean, if I'm thinking about a normal IPO, that's the way people normally go. So for a SPAC IPO, the advantages are a few. I, I think what's most, most important is that you got a valuation up front. You know exactly what the valuation is going to be when you think about that. You don't have to deal with the volatility of the overall markets. And so a lot of folks were going towards a SPAC route because the volatility is somewhat mitigated because you actually know the overall valuation. The other things around this is that you think about the fact that you can go a little faster. 
So when you think about a normal traditional IPO process, you're going through all these different things I mentioned, is the market ready for this? You know, what's happening in terms of back and forth with the SEC? Well, you've got a public company now that acquires someone else, you can move things forward. You get to a point where you say, this is actually a more simple route. And that's why I think it started to happen, especially during the pandemic, Maureen, I think we got to a point where companies were worried about what the overall markets were gonna do. And therefore with all of this available cash, we'll talk, I'll talk about a little bit more in a second, they wanted to find a way to put the money towards something. So I think that people said, this is a good way to go because again, we can give the money to those that have the experience and make things happen. But of course, the disadvantages. Uh, we'll talk about the warrants in a second, but what it comes down to is that you got a really short time frame. So what makes this SPAC so great is you can do it a little easier, but the reality is there are some downsides. So usually a SPAC has a life cycle of 18 to 24 months. So think about that, raise your money, look at different um, entities, try to go ahead and, and combine with another company and make it all go through the SEC in a time frame. So usually you're off the races. Once you find your target, you're, the clock starts to tick pretty quickly. So what ends up happening here is that you gotta make sure you get the right asset you're looking at. So I do believe that there are some pros, but definitely some cons. And one that I think, I'm, I think is probably the most important one is that imagine you're a private company who, okay, if you're ready, then the idea is that you can become a public company pretty quickly. All the SOX pieces, you're ready for that overall discussion. But many companies today who want to be public through the SPAC route, it's not about just being public, it's also about staying public. And so the idea of trying to ensure that you're in a place to be a public company doing all that public companies can do is rather difficult because the time frame is overall truncated. So I'd say there are definitely pros and cons to this, but clearly the marketplace is saying we're interested in the SPAC market, and here we are. So let's talk about the market itself and move forward here. So if I think about what's happened in the SPAC market absent the last few weeks, look at Q1 2021. There were 99 acquisitions by SPACs. In all of 2020, there were 97. 2019, there were 30. So we've been tracking SPACs um, every week in terms of our task force. And I was seeing between 35 to 45 SPAC IPOs per week. So of course, you got to think about the fact these SPAC IPOs aren't closing deals right away, but think about the overall volume. And if everyone is out there trying to find an overall target, the question is doing your right diligence, getting to a place you feel comfortable about things. But the reality is the trend was really going up. And the one thing I'll talk about is there was recently some discussion from the SEC regarding the treatment of warrants. And warrants are part of the investment vehicle used by the various folks who are involved in the SPACs and provide some upside for the overall valuation and for them coming in the door earlier in the overall process. And the question was around the treatment of those warrants. And there's an evaluation period going on right now for companies because it's about classification of those warrants. And I won't get too much to technical accounting here, but generally speaking, they were being treated as equity. And that gives you a certain amount, you know you're going to expect every period. Uh, but there was a view that said they should be treated as, as liabilities and therefore requires a mark to market of that warrant every period, which presents some volatility into the overall income statement of the SPAC and therefore has to be reevaluated. So what we saw was an immediate decline in, in new SPAC IPOs trying to figure out exactly what this overall rule meant because most of these warrants were treated the same across the overall market. And you get to a place now that could um, throw some cold water on the overall marketplace, but I know Jim will have his perspective around that. But the reality is we did see a decline immediately after the SEC weighing in on a few of these accounting issues. But nonetheless, the idea here is that if you go back years and years and years, combine all the SPAC IPOs compared to where we are in Q1 21, you are seeing uh, a major trend. Now, next slide talks about the actual volume in terms of dollar amount. So traditionally, I think every SPAC that we've seen is about $250, $300 million in terms of what they have for overall equity. But in terms of the marketplace here, you're seeing a bunch of capital being deployed. So this idea of dry powder, uh, people trying to deploy their funds into something, um, you're seeing the amount of opportunity here to go out and acquire other companies. And the real view is after this whole warrant issue is evaluated and settled, you still have these companies that are out there trying to find targets. So will they go to the private equity market? They will. Will they go to 
outside the U.S. shores, they potentially will as well to find these overall assets that can be targets for their SPAC. So what it tells you is that there are still a bunch of SPACs out there looking for targets. And so regardless of what's going on, we still see activity. But I want to point out the fact here that it's clear to me that the marketplace is still saying that we do believe SPACs are a viable vehicle for conversation. And what we try to do here in this overall slide is talk about the fact that when you think about the overall view, you couldn't turn on any business uh, channel or show in the morning without hearing about so-and-so doing a SPAC and going IPO that route. And the many, many companies out there that you've heard about that have gone through this route. So the view is that it's out here and I think it's gonna be around for a period of time. I know Jim schooled me to say the market's the market and folks will go where they wanna go. So for sure, I'd say opportunities still exist in the SPAC market, but I believe there's gonna be a little bit more uh, guardrails around it only because of the SEC weighing into their perspective around what this really means. Let's move forward and talk through some more of the overall life cycle conversation for the SPAC. So let's first start on pre-deal. So as I mentioned, we talked about the view of trying to find your overall investments, um, trying to make sure you're thinking about the SPAC itself. Um, normally speaking, the SPAC's gonna go out and try to find a bunch of different assets to look at. So you're really trying to hone in on what makes the best sense. And the challenge here, going back to that view of having limited cash, if you think about that, you wanna deploy your cash in the right way and be most effective. And so doing a full blue blown diligence, you gotta think about what you wanna focus on. Is that target viable in terms of all they talk about in terms of quality of earnings, um, tax structuring, those types of things. But of course, are they also ready to be a true public company? That's a very important part of considering all these things as part of what you do. Um, then I mentioned the overall valuation being between 250, $300 million in terms of their overall investment. Well, what tends to happen is what's called a pipe investment, which is a private investment in public entity. So after the companies are already public, they may go out and get more funds. And that's usually the way the market has been where they're trying to get more funds because they found a viable target, but need to go ahead and, and raise more funds to go ahead and pay for that target. And so the pipe market as it's known as, was a place where folks were going to at the initial SPAC to get more funding to buy another company. So they're thinking about the idea of focusing on getting more investment. And then you get to a point where you go to your pre-close now. So you have your investment, you're thinking about all these things. And what's really, really important here is that the clock starts to tick. So you wanna make sure that before you're ready, go ahead and say ready to merge, that you've gone through all you gotta do, making sure that you feel confident the company is ready to be public. We see a lot of these targets at this point, then doing what we call a public company readiness assessment. Uh, we talk about diligence, but diligence clearly is, do I like the company? How do I feel about them? Are they ready? But here in this readiness, back to the idea of those months, trying to make sure the infrastructure is fully established in terms of being able to navigate closing the books on a recurring period of time, internal controls, the idea of making sure that you have the right management infrastructure, those types of things. There's a discussion with the SEC prior to the close. And then at that point, you're closing. You have to go ahead and file an 8K, which talks about the combined company, not just the SPAC itself, but the SPAC and the actual target as one and how they would look. So the pro forma statements, all those types of things. At that point in time, you're off for the races. And so when you think about this bottom part here, when you, we think about this, it's about not just the accounting, but it's also the systems. It's also the internal controls types of things. And that to me is a very important part of it. So I may say it's easy to go from the SPAC route. You've got to do a lot of work here to make sure you're ready to become a public company. If there's any type of risk around this, it's that because public company day one, but you keep going. So trying to ensure that you're meeting all of the investor requirements of this. And when you look back at some of the SPAC IPOs, those have done acquisitions in the last couple of months. How is that stock performing? And the question is, is that company doing all they said they were going to do as a public company? That's to be seen. But definitely an area that we're seeing uh, of some concern for many of the investors because they thought it was going to be a great thing. And then as time goes along, things start to shift a little bit. So we'll go on. And the one thing I want to do here, Jim, is talk about your experience. I just spent some time talking about accounting. I know how great and smart you are on this front. But I gave you my perspective as an advisor to a company like yourself. How about you and how you're living it? Would you agree, disagree? Tell me your views on the marketplace and why you decided that SPAC made sense. We'll talk about that. 
Well, I, I disagree with everything you said. Uh, pretty team. much. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So I guess we're done. Good, good summary of, uh, of the uh, overall landscape and the uh, wise and wherefores. I think what I would drill down on first through the, the good information you shared, Dean, is that uh, you have a new tool available, new to the sense of newly popular. It's a 20 year old tool, SPACs are over 20 years old, but they're newly, uh, newly uh, in fashion. And as you pointed out, uh, all of last year, there were 115 uh, SPAC IPOs, and in the first quarter of this year, 282. So the pace was uh, at an unsustainable level, unsustainable just because of the support infrastructure. Maureen, uh, I know uh, people say, well, the, the market takes care of itself, and it does, uh, because I know KPMG, one of the premier firms in the world, has been overwhelmed uh, by demand for services related to SPACs. I know that the, uh, the law firms have been overwhelmed. So there's a natural gating agent there. And, and a firm like KPMG is a gating agent because they say, we're only gonna take clients we already know. We're not gonna take new clients and we have limited bandwidth. So you have a number of factors that are gonna retard the flow of the, the, the unsustainable flow of SPAC. But the market beneath that, there's a market for potential companies. It's estimated that there are 5,000 private companies in private equity portfolios that are likely close to or already SPAC ready. And I'll ask Paul uh, Stamoulis, my partner at Clarum to chime in, but it seems to me that uh, this is here to stay. Uh, not to, not to uh, look past the, the concerns that you brought up, Dean, about uh, the SEC being concerned about the pace of this and therefore uh, saying, hey, we might wanna look at this which basically is called the KPMG Full Employment Act, uh, because if you guys have to go back and restate uh, the tens, the Qs, et cetera, for all these companies that have gone public in the last few years, that's an enormous amount of work. And I know Maureen, you have too much free time now, but you'll have even less <laughs> if, if that goes through, but better for the pension plan. I understand it's all about you. <laughs> but I think the essence of what we see, that is Paul and I, uh, Dean, and Maureen, is that uh, you have three ways of going public today. You can go public in a traditional IPO. And we all know how that works. Dean, you pointed out, it takes a long time. It's quite expensive. And uh, you don't have the opportunity to develop an investor base by sitting down and engaging with investors and talking to them about your plans and your projections and how this, how this goes and letting them get to know you. Uh, but, uh, and the second way is you can do a direct listing, which has become more popular in the last few years, especially with these large tech companies that don't need capital and therefore don't need to uh, incur the underwriting expense. They're already from a governance point of view and a transparency point of view ready. So they would just make a direct listing and, and much less expensive, simpler to do. And you've seen that, for example, with Spotify. And then the third way now is this, this SPAC option where you have an increasingly uh, a, a large set of sophisticated investors who say, not only do we bring the structure of a SPAC, not only do we bring uh, the capital, in our case, $287.5 million, but we also bring a, a, a management team in the form of the managers of the sponsor, the, that's Paul and myself and our partners, it's our board of directors because now governance plays an important role for these companies that are new to be public. And, uh, and boards are very, very, very important now. Their composition, their expertise, their brands, their personal brands, what they stand for. And so where we as a SPAC sponsor can be helpful there. We already have a, a three person board in place, uh, three outside director board in place. And then the, uh, uh, so that's the third alternative, IP, traditional IPO, direct listing, or a SPAC IPO. And a SPAC IPO also gives you the opportunity, as you mentioned, to do this thing called the pipe. So you form a company, the public votes. Do you get your money or not? Okay. Now they have a second vote, which is you find uh, the company that you think is ready for prime time. And that's what being public is. It's, it's prime time. We think the business is ready. We think the management is ready. We think that we add value to that management team with our 
management team, our board, our board and our advisory group. And we're uh, focused on areas where we think we have deep expertise. In our case, we're looking at companies that wanna have a direct relationship with their customer. That doesn't mean they have to be a direct to the consumer selling company, but we would be prejudiced toward companies that are omni-channel. And even if they're a manufacturer, we, in this digital age, everyone should have a direct dialogue with their end user and their end customer. So that's where we're focused. And of course, having uh, run uh, flowers for 40 years, uh, we think we have some knowledge and expertise about how to go direct to the consumer, how to use technology, how to, uh, how to anticipate where technology is going and how to be ready for that. So if I were to, uh, to focus on what I think would be the most natural for us, would be a company that uh, has a lot of growth in front of them. Uh, we're seeing, I'll give you an example of uh, conversations we'll have, but I'll anonymize it. Uh, family owned business, quite large. We'd all know it in this metropolitan area. Uh, really good brand, really good company, three generations involved in the business. And now they have issues. The issues are some of the third generation aren't involved in the business at all. And so when they vote, they say, <laughs> Don't spend more capital on the business. I want cash flow. Well, that creates a dynamic that's not good for the business because maybe they need that capital to grow the business because if you're not growing, you're declining. There is no in between. Oh, we'll just stay here. No, you either have to grow or go. And so a family business I like that, uh, Paul and I were involved with a couple of these last year and into this year where it might be that we'll recommend a SPAC is the right way for them to go. Because as you mentioned, Dean, they have an opportunity to take some cash off the table. So generation three, some of them say, I wanna stay involved in the business. Some say, I wanna cash out. Others in, in between, they say, well, I want to take something off the table, but I wanna leave quite a bit in too. Well, a SPAC gives you the discretion to do all of those things. It also gives you growth capital. So in an IPO, you really don't have the chance to take money off the table and satisfy the needs of those family members that have different plans and ideas. They live in another part of the country that's not involved in a business. It's just a check they get every quarter or so. So uh, it, for a family businesses like that, it, it would oftentimes be an elegant solution. Could you? They have to be ready, Maureen. They have to be ready in terms of the CFO and their systems and their governance and their willingness to play by new governance rules. What's your development plan for those new family members to help them develop their skills so they can be involved in the management of the business someday? You gotta be real about it. And so this, and for those situations, brings a nice discipline in terms of governance, in terms of planning, in terms of development, and in terms of use of capital. So it's not a silver bullet that you know, solves every situation, but for a fast growth tech company, uh, a startup that's reached a platform now where they want to go faster and they don't want to wait 12 to 18 months to go through an IPO process. And so much of their story is about the future. Shouldn't they get to tell that? So for those two groups of companies, those three groups, the, the fast growing tech company, the fast growing consumer facing company that's now reached a new plateau. And then those family businesses that are looking at generational transitions. For that, those three clusters of companies, this could be quite a, quite a good solution. I got to poke on you a little bit here, Jim, because, you know, I am a Mets fan, too, just to make sure we're clear about that. But well, that's why I like you and dislike yeah. Maureen so much. Fair, fair enough. So back to the idea of the world of uh, spending dollars in the Equal Employment Act for the uh, accounting profession. Where did you decide to put your funds, the limited in terms of what you can spend on? So thinking about this audience, I talked through the limited amount of cash for diligence and tax services. What thoughts do you have around that? Well, I, I'm not sure the, the heart of the question there, but look, being public isn't inexpensive. It, it, it's, it's, re, it's so many things good about it. And there are things that are, give you pause, which is the expense of all of this. And for us, uh, you know, this is, this, this is a risk on our part too. You know, we put up about something approaching $10 million to do this. And if we decide there isn't a good target, uh, Paul, Paul takes one month less vacation next year. Uh, it's a, there, there's risk capital here. So there's genuine risk. And we've been, I'll tell you a little secret here. We've already looked at 11 companies that wanted us to partner with them. And we said, no, 
they weren't ready or the business plan didn't have enough growth in it. 10 of those 11 have already announced a partnership with another SPAC. So Paul, are we, are we being too picky or are we being disciplined in sticking to our knitting? That's a great question, Jim. I, I think it remains to be seen and to some degree. I, I think I, the fact is um, what we've looked at is this is a partnership and this is a partnership of bringing our skills to bear, our experience to bear, our mind share to bear. And it gets personal pretty quickly. I mean, these companies and these leaders are at a pretty formative stage, both personally and professionally where they're raising some of the most significant capital they've ever raised. They'll have to deploy it in, in a way that um, creates a lot of corporate risk, um, investment risk. Um, and so all of those are very large decisions. And so what you tend to find is this really needs to be a match between what the sponsor brings to the table and where and, and what the target ambitions are. And, uh, at the surface, the technology of a SPAC is facilitative, and, and so that tends to get you into the first couple of innings of the dialogue. But when you go into that next stage, uh, you know, how does the sponsor, how will the sponsor be involved post-combination? How, how facilitative is the sponsor to helping them understand that maybe they have to consider um, their C-suite in a slightly different way as a public company than they do as a private company or board members. And when you get into those conversations, you know, the yeses and nos start to come out in terms of match. Um, you know, remains to be seen how that all works out until we all look back on this, on this flurry of activity to see how all of this is performed. But uh, as, a, as an operator, Jim, you know, you, you've always told me this and, and our team this is it's not about overvaluing or undervaluing a company. It's about creating value for a company in the future. And that's really where the focus, at least ours, is on this whole effort. Dean, uh, it seems to me that you would have seen in your work uh, two different kinds of SPAC sponsors. So we're a SPAC sponsor. One kind is financial engineers. Uh, they're Wall Street savvy. They have good brand reputations. They've made money uh, for people in the past. And they say, we're going to create a structure. We're going to get it done. We know the investors. We get the money in there. And then once we de SPAC, merge with you, you're off to the races. We're out of here. Adios. And then there's the other kind, the operating kind, which we uh, fancy ourselves as, where we intend to stay invested in that company for a very long time. And we plan on, uh, we think we bring some value add with our, our, our partners, our board members, and our advisors uh, that we think we're going to be value added to that company. So let me, is that what you're seeing, that uh, bifurcation there? Absolutely, Jim. It's the question I was going to ask you. You probably have missed the third kind, which again was the athlete and the celebrity. I'm not sure where they fit in in terms of the financial, the operating, but that's the one classification that. Um, concerns me a little bit because they have the in background to say we know what we're doing or do they have the financial connections and know how to do it right bringing someone else in I was gonna get your thoughts not to disparage anyone but back to your reputation of being able to navigate this world that third area is one that started to concern me somewhat um, when you got out of those two categories you just talked about that third category started to bother me because background checks we started doing like why is this person doing this can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that third group to me is one I'm somewhat concerned about. I, I don't think it matters very much. I really don't. Uh, they're going to get washed out. As Warren Buffett says, when the wave goes out, you find out uh, who's wearing uh, swim trucks. And uh, that, that's, that's what happens when something gets frothed. And, and uh, look, celebrity matters in this world, but it, uh, it doesn't count for very much when you're in a tough time and you have a tough end of quarter and you're not sure what to do. What are you going to call up someone who had a really good batting average for good input there in terms of uh, uh, what you should do uh, in, in that moment? No, you want to call people who've been there, been through that, know how to work with your professional services firms like KPMG. You know, in, in our company uh, at Flowers, we have a seasoned uh, uh, chair of our audit committee who's a, a veteran, ran a whole practice area at KPMG until he retired, Gene DeMarc. And you want someone at the table like that, who's been there, done that, had the hand on the till, isn't going to get rattled and works you through the project. But better than that, if they've been through all of those things, 
that help you to anticipate and avoid those, those uh, uh, stomach churning moments. Batting average doesn't help you there unless it's a batting average of having dealt with those situations. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Jim, I'll tell you, when, when we talked about the conversation and prep for this, I was very impressed with your knowledge of the warrant market. You talked to me about how the navigation of the market would be. In your opening comments, you did refer to the fact that this is an area that you think was still going to be a viable option in the three different ways of accessing the public markets. And again, you don't have a crystal ball here, but given what you're seeing and the fact that there's so many opportunities out there, private equity type of assets and private companies all over the world, what's your view in terms of the SPAC market? Well, I think we're going through the anticipated correction. You couldn't continue that pace. The professional services firms couldn't keep up with it. So uh, the SEC, very, uh, very savvy. They said, this is what we're thinking about. And poof, this month we've had a total of 10 IPOs in, uh, in all, I guess it's all of April. There are no more than a handful of IPOs. Uh, here we are in May and it's, it's a trickle. I think there was zero last week for the first time in, in, a, in a long, long time. So it had its intended effect. It caused the people to say, wait a minute, there's a work, a tremendous amount of work to do if we have to go backwards. Where are we going to get the arms and legs to do this? Uh, and uh, now you look around at your advisors and say, you know, I don't really have the best accounting firm here. And I really don't have the best law firm who knows what they're doing in this area. Maybe I ought to slow down here and wait until KPMG has some bandwidth for Because quality does matter. So I think the intention of the SEC was clear. They wanted to tap the brakes. They did. And now you're going to see... The people had no business being in SPACs, take some risk losses on their risk capital. But I tend to think those people who could hit a jump shot or uh, hit it over the fence in, in, in the city field uh, are, are going to be hard pressed to find the right deals in a more rigorous market. And you mentioned pipes before, and it's just these acronyms make people who aren't in the world crazy. But that's your second, second checkpoint. So you have the one checkpoint is, did you raise the money? The second checkpoint is people get the option, investors. This is why it's such a good investment. So we're on both sides of this. We want to be investor in other people's pipes and of course have our own. But now you get to look at the deal again and you get the benefit of the management team and a board and advisories due diligence. Their interaction with the company say, no, we're putting our brand at risk here and saying these are the people that we think have the right business, the right business plan, and we think they're ready for prime time like any underwriter would. We're not, of course, an underwriter here, but we're playing a little bit of that verification role. So you get all that together and now shell is good to say, I like the deal or I don't like the deal. If I don't like the deal, I get my money back plus treasury, treasury rates of return, and it's guaranteed money. Right. Uh, and uh, and now you can raise this pipe. So let's say you're going to do a billion dollar deal and you bring 300 million equity from your pipe IPO. And now you're out there, you, rest is going to be in equity. And now you're going to do a $50 million pipe that you go back to investors and you say, Here, come across, you have to sign an NDA, come across the wall, they say, and meet with management, get to know them the way we do. Here are our plans for the company. Here where we think it goes. Meet the team, get a feel for it. And if they say, yes, I want to invest more into the deal now, that's another vote stage. So I think, uh, I think uh, there's only so much capacity out there for people who want to invest in these. And that gives you a third checkpoint of what's not a good deal. And then the fourth one is it trades in the public market and the public will decide what the company's worth. So everybody now gets corralled into, is it really a good company? Is it really ready for prime time? Is management really ready committed to this whole big league idea of governance, transparency, people development, ESG requirements and, and needs. Do they have all of that in place? And if they do, you know there's a big hole in the market, Dean? There are half as many public companies today as there were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, that's crazy. The market's grown so much. Shouldn't it be three or four times what it was 20 years ago? And the answer is yes, but there have been market forces that have driven the number of public companies down. And now this is a response to that pendulum swing where it's going to bubble back up. But I know, Maureen, you and I were talking about companies we know that are out there that this in, in Long Island, we know many that this is something that they should consider. Partnering with a SPAC that has the right management team and experience and savvy, has the right capital to help them structure properly for growth, 
and to take care of all those other issues, lots of times family related. And for them, this is a elegant, quick, but not simple solution. Yeah. And Jim, what would you say to those companies? How would you tell them to maybe connect to the market or explore further how to get engaged in this potential uh, you know, option for them? Well, I think they should uh, chat with their, their professional advisors they already have in place because those firms all, have, like you guys have developed this deep kernel of knowledge. They should engage with their with KPMG. They should engage with their law firm saying, do you, do you know here what law firms have a specialty in this area? And then there are uh, plenty of good uh, advisors. There's, you know, there's a whole lot of people on Wall Street. There's probably six or seven really good firms that have a SPAC specialty in them uh, that have been doing this for a long time. And that's a, a very worthwhile cup of coffee to say, do you think we're ready? Here's, here's who we are. Open the kimono a little bit. Here's who we are. Here's who we're ready. But those professional services firms will be their first stop in terms of checking how, how, how big a step is it for me to, to be compliant? Uh, am, I, uh, am, I, am I ready to do that? How much work do I have to do to get there? And you'll get good feedback. Great. Well, Jim, I'm going to start talking about accounting and tax matters again. I just wanted to make sure. All right, I'll be turning off now. <laughs> yes, before I switch gears, any parting thoughts in terms of advice? I mean, Maureen asked a great question on the advice for the overall targets out there. How about any advice for the SPACs that are out there right now looking to find an asset because clock's ticking? Well, I, I think some of them are going to be in a tough spot. Paul, I think you'd agree uh, that uh, uh, the, the prices have adjusted in the market. Uh, the market corrects itself. And what people will pay for companies or how valuations are determined, those screws are tightening. That's appropriate. So I think they need to uh, consider uh, the quality of the sponsor and the sponsor group. Do they just want a vehicle and no real involvement? See you later. Or do they want someone who's going to be there with them for, uh, for a long time who can help them with their growth strategy? populating their board, uh, the outside advisors that they bring in. Sometimes the advisors that got them here aren't the advisors that take them to the next level. Uh, there's a reason why there's a, a gradation in the, in, the, uh, in the professional services firms. And I think you have to go through that checklist. But if you know someone who's in the world, uh, if it's in this community, likely we all know one another. That's a, that's, a, that's a Zoom cup of coffee to have a quick conversation to figure that out. Thanks, Jim. But so, I, think, I think to your point, I think there's some SPACs that are going to go poof. Yes, we shall see. So I'm going to come back to you in a second here. I'm going to get through maybe two more things and then we get to open up some Q&A. But the one area I do want to spend some time on is on tax. And I am not a tax professional, but I will tell you in the conversations I've been having, there are definitely different ways to structure on the tax side. And so we are seeing some very interesting structure, like these up sea structures, which help. Especially good for families uh, making the transition, right, Dean? Exactly. So ways to minimize some of the tax burden. So back to Jim's point, you want to make sure you do have a tax advisor to navigate the best way, not to only say the word mitigate the tax burden, to make sure that you're more efficient in your tax planning. So I'm not going to spend time going through this, but yes, there are ways to do your best to protect some of the value of the investment from the overall private side. So I wanna put that out there for consideration. And what I'll do next is talk about uh, just some of the audit considerations. So we've done a good job at least talking about the business side of things, but clearly I wanna clarify two things. Um, from a SPAC perspective, as I mentioned, generally speaking, the balance sheet in the, of the SPAC is pretty simple, cash and equity. So you have a SPAC audit from that perspective, and you're focusing on it, of course, as a public company. But it tends to be a little bit more simple because the overall operations of the SPAC aren't as complicated. Now, when you're on the target side, you're trying to think about who you are. At that point, you're probably getting audited under AICPA standards, a lot less stringent than the PCLB standards that come as being part of a public company. So you wanna make sure that when you're thinking about your auditor, to Jim's point, the ability to make sure that auditor can poke and prod around how it is to be a public company, to make sure that you have all your policies ready to go as a public company, 
to make sure you understand things around materiality, how you're going to be looked at throughout the quarterly periods, then you can get different than where you were as an AICPA audit. So these are very, very important things and differentiations. And sometimes you see a change in auditor when it comes down to the despacking process, just because of the need to have a lot more complexity and a lot more people that can navigate around that. So that's one very important thing I want to point out here. And what we'll do is we'll end on um, one piece here in terms of um, the uh, requirements. Go to the next slide. Challenges. So thinking about this, there's different worlds in terms of independence and communications. As a private company, you have a certain amount of folks you're talking to all the time. As a public company, a lot more going on. So you want to make sure, again, you're thinking about all this. And back to the idea of internal controls, uh, Jim mentioned systems. He mentioned a lot of the things in terms of infrastructure. Uh, this one, I can't underestimate the overall impact and burden. So yes, it's really cool to become a public company, but can you navigate all the things that are required around this part of the process? And lastly here, from a SOX you perspective- your vocabulary barbecues too. <laughs> hey, how's business? Well, we're up 18% this quarter. You just committed a felony. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So you got to navigate all those rules and this Sarbanes-Oxley stuff, you're certifying a lot in terms of your assertions around the overall statements, uh, how the internal controls are operating. And the one thing you want to be is a company that has material weaknesses around internal control structuring, especially around financial reporting. So I put this out there just to say to you that there's a lot that goes into it. And I think Jim was being kind in terms of the navigation of the hard work, but a lot's going to happen here in terms of certification requirements. So I want to stop there, Jim, because I think I saw you falling asleep there a while ago on that last page. So we may want to talk about just additional Q&A from the audience, Maureen, but I wanted to at least make sure we touched on the major aspects of the uh, mundane parts of being a public company as well. Maureen, let's uh, let's interact with uh, our audience here. There are some questions, but to the point that Dean just made, uh, it shouldn't scare a company away from being public because there are lots of protocols. There's a reason why there's a public company, private company difference in valuation. Because in a public company, you're, it, it, there's extra expenses to be as compliant as you need to be. And therefore you deserve if you're going to take outside investors' capital into your company, you have to you have to be able to look them in the eye and say we've done all the things that are appropriate to do. Business will be business, but in terms of compliance and systems and governance, we got everything in place. And and then you get rewarded with a multiple uh, a multiple of earnings higher, sometimes one, two, three, four turns, because you are compliant because investors can trust that you're doing things properly, that you have all the systems in place to assure that things are being done in the proper fashion. Thank you for that. And uh, just a couple of questions. Um, and surprisingly, they're not necessarily SPAC related, but they're interested more, Jim, in, in one of the questions is, what does it mean to you to be a major employer on Long Island with 1-800-Flowers being a public company on Long Island, particularly in these times of really high unemployment, et cetera? Um, somebody's looking for your perspectives on that. Well, a couple of things. Uh, one is something that uh, we've been concerned here about at Clarum and at Flowers uh, for uh, probably five or six months now is uh, that uh, companies are gonna be starved for growth this summer, this fall, this winter, because there's gonna be a lack of, uh, lack of workers. You see it on Long Island now, there was a story on News 12 over the weekend about restaurants finally being able to, they've survived the dark winter of COVID and now they're getting ready to reopen and they can't find people to work. And I'm hearing that we do, uh, we have facilities in 40 different states and every one of those 40 states, uh, it's difficult to find labor. So there's a, and there's a bifurcation that happened as a result of COVID. Uh, companies like Flowers, 1-800 Flowers, where we are in the business of people expressing and connecting, especially around emotional and celebratory events. Uh, our business was wildly impacted because of increased demand. Mm -hmm. But if you were a restaurateur in Patchogue or, or, a, uh, or a, a theater in uh, Northport, you just got crushed. And there was nothing you could do about it. It wasn't anything you could have foreseen or done. So it's had a binary effect on businesses. But I think the real challenge going forward is going to be uh, available labor. 
And I think a lot of people, you know, well-intentioned with unintended consequences, uh, lots of times we're competing with unemployment. Wait a minute, I can uh, collect $600, sit here on the couch and not take any risk of exposure and uh, maybe not make that much more money coming to work. I'll opt for the 600 on the couch. Mm -hmm. I think there's something really wrong with that. I think if they genuinely can find work, that's fine. But when you're when labor like uh, companies like ours are competing with unemployment all over the country, that denies people the opportunity for the dignity of work. Uh, work is a lot more than a paycheck. It's social. It's a liaison d'etre. It's a it's a, a feeling of accomplishment to provide uh, or, or at least contribute to the uh, to the well-being of your family and of your community. And when we lose that 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 ethic of uh, of work. Uh, I think uh, I think as a society will will pay a price for it. So that's that's my big concern in the near term is that the economy is already roaring, and it's it's going to drag a lot of people who haven't been involved in. And I just hope uh, that some of these small businesses that weren't able to survive that they take a shot again and they get the help they need to get back into businesses. Because in this island that we all live in here is so. Sort of it's Patchogue downtown, where they have a great mayor who's made that a wonderful, vibrant community. Uh, it's West Hampton, it's Huntington, all these towns that have a lot of empty storefronts and a lot of empty restaurants. That, those are the lifeblood of our community. So I'm, I hope that we all support those shops and help them come back and, and, and be uh, vigorous as ever. But uh, they're all struggling for labor right now. That's right. So we hear about high unemployment, yet we can't find anybody. What's wrong? I know it doesn't make any sense. I, I hear you. I see it in my own backyard here, and it's you know it's worrying. Hoping hoping we see something changing soon. Dean, real quick for you. I know we only have maybe a minute or two, but um, you know you work in this space, and I'm sure you're helping companies go through their assessments to to readiness assessments. Do you find that companies try to get involved with this on the early end where they're really not ready and they just kind of like taking a shot at it because it's so hot and it's so exciting to be part of something so big and in the news all the time? Um, the good news is I met Jim. He told me to be direct and transparent with my clients. And what I tell them is you're not quite ready for this journey. And so I hope they get an advisor that tells them the truth. But yes, there are a few trying to jump on the bandwagon because now the time is ripe. The real reality is though, there are a lot of these companies that are failing as a result of not being ready. So I would just make sure you can look in the mirror and evaluate where you, where you really are. Hopefully having an advisor tells you the same because back to the assessment, it's gonna tell you how far away you are from being public. And if you're doing it the right way, it's gonna say green light here, red light here, do not go. And hopefully folks listen to that as part of their process. But it sounds like you have a, yell, a yellow light option there, Dean, which is you can give them- I didn't a give you yellow there. light, Jim. I only gave you red and green at this point, so. You're not, you're not going to help your clients to develop a roadmap to get ready if they're not? Of course I will. Of course I will. <laughs> Come on, Dean, there are fees involved. <laughs> so I think that's all we have today in, time, in terms of uh, time for questions. But I'm going to now turn it back over to Matt, Jim, and, and Dean. Thanks so much for the great conversation. I really appreciate it. A pleasure to interact with you anytime, Maureen. You're a real star here in the business community on Long Island. And Dean, as a subject matter expert, you're the best. Thank, Thank you Jim. so much, Jim. Enjoyed it. Uh, thanks, Maureen. And you know, it's it's funny. I was I was watching this event. Uh, I got a Wall Street Journal news alert about SPACs and an investor who created 13 SPACs more than any other single investor. Literally, while I was watching this event, I got that news uh, news break. So uh, I just wanted to thank Maureen, Dean, Jim. Uh, Paul, I want to thank Carolyn Mazenga, Miriam Tannenbaum, and Jeff Alter, our other chairs of this committee, and our great board chairman, Larry Waldman. Um, I didn't know much about stack, SPACs before, and now I feel like I got a PhD in it, uh, thanks to you guys, so, so thank you. Uh, I just want to do a quick plug for a few upcoming LIA events. Uh, on May 12th, we're having Talking Business with uh, Newsday publisher Debbie Krennic at 10 a.m., and then on May 13th, we have an International Trade Committee event about entering the Canadian market at 2 p.m., uh, on May 18th at 10 a.m., we have an event we call Business Today with a panel of business leaders uh, talking about how they navigated the pandemic and their outlook for the future. On May 21st at 10 a.m., we just booked uh, Congressman Tom Swazi, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the federal infrastructure bill, his efforts to repeal SALT, 
and other things going on in Washington. And finally, on May 25th at 9 a.m., we're going to have a great panel discussion with uh, MacArthur Airport, Southwest Airlines, and others about the state of the airline industry, um, in, you know, in light of the pandemic and what's what to look for going forward. So again, I just wanted to thank everybody, especially Maureen, for helping put this great uh, event together. And uh, uh, it's serendipitous that we had Jim here. It's Mother's Day this Sunday. Remember to buy your mother flowers. Um, and I hope everybody has a great Mother's Day, great weekend. And again, I want to thank Maureen and our panelists uh, for this really informative and uh, in interesting discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Thank you.